Well, hello and good morning. We have a, another great lecture for you in the series. So today's lecture is charting your career transition. You know, this is a wonderful opportunity to look around in the marketplace, to reassess your career. Um, so many people that I work with, you know, they've reached a, a certain level in what they've done, but you know, pandemic has caused everybody to rethink, is this really what I should do? Is this what I enjoy? If you're looking to make a career transition, the first step is to understand what the new target market looks like or what the new direction looks like. And then we have to go back and retell our story properly so that we're of interest to that new direction. So <clears throat> we're gonna share a lot with you today that I know is gonna be a, a good addition. Keep in mind, it's the entire series. So it started last Monday, a week ago Monday, with my resume renovation. Then we went through LinkedIn, uh, using social media in your job search. Um, one other topic as well. Today's charting your career transition. Yesterday was interview intervention. Uh, tomorrow, which is going to be a special three o'clock in the afternoon, because I have a <laughs> dental appointment I have to take care of in the morning. But the three o'clock tomorrow afternoon is another really astounding lecture reaching out to the decision maker, teaching you all the steps to reach to the decision maker directly, really bypassing HR. <laughs> Unless you'd like to be hired in HR, keep in mind, HR folks are the only type of folks HR actually hires. So let's get on to today, charting your career transition. Um, and what are we going to run into? I object to your lack of industry background if you're going to another direction. This is really about learning how to not take no for an answer because their reaction will be, but you don't have this, you don't have that, but you don't have experience in this role. Role that you're in right now, you didn't have experience in at some point. The role before that you didn't have experience in at some point. Many people can try something new, but you have to inspire them with confidence that if they roll the dice on you, they're going to get something different. Otherwise we end up in, well, you can't do that. You don't have the background. Really? <laughs> I, I've reinvented myself several times over the course of my career doing very, very different things. Um, it's not really as simple as just seeing the job, going after the job, I'll get the interview and, and you know, if it only worked that easily. But everybody else and some of them that seem perfect are hitting that darn apply button, usually saying submit, submit, submit. But those seemingly perfect people make them look at us that are a little bit different and go, well, gosh, why should I go that direction? A whole host of reasons, which I'll share with you today. Now, the secret you may not like about all of this is the belief that you can only do whatever you've done before. So it's like somehow carved in stone, can't change that over time. But I can tell you it's complete nonsense. I've done very different things throughout the course of my career at different stages based on what interested me and how I could be valuable to that new field. Um, if we simply accept that, you know, you have, you started on this track 10, 20 years ago or whatever it might have been. That's what it is for you. And you end up in these kind of unhappy places. Well, um, you don't have to stay here. Another thing that we should talk about in making your career transition, I've spoken to a number of people that suddenly go, oh, but, you know, I want to go do this new thing and I'm, I'm willing to start at the bottom. Okay, sometimes, but but why would you start at the bottom? If you're mid-career or even beyond mid-career, changing careers does not mean you have to start at the bottom. It does mean you have to start uh, with a, a focused effort to get yourself up to speed in that new sector, but you bring a lot to the table and much of those skills are transferable. So I am certainly not a believer that just because you go into a new industry, you have to start at the bottom. You do have to keep yourself open to growth and you have to learn what's missing. This idea that we can only do what's been done before, it's a rut. We have to get over it. Quit accepting what other people tell you and just think for a moment, but I mean, it's not, not possible, but if it was possible, how could I get there? How could I get there working backward, aligning the sun, the moon, the stars to discover a pathway? It's a lot of ways. First, first off though, we have to get out of our own way. Now, most of our competitors fit this here. I spoke about this yesterday. I love to read it. Mediocre, <laughs> of only moderate quality, not very good, ordinary, average, middling, middle of the road, uninspired, undistinguished, indifferent, on and on and on, not up to much and bushly. Well, if this 
is really the bulk of the workforce, which says some sad things for our future. Uh, but if this is the bulk of the workforce, what do you have to be? Just a little tiny bit better than mediocre to be ahead of mostly everybody. If you simply put a little heart and soul into whatever it is that you want to do, even as you're transitioning, you'll be far better than the people that have been in that field. Because the people that are in that field tend to bring their baggage with them. Oh, yes, they may bring some understanding and knowledge of how to do that job one way. But oftentimes they bring all the problems that they've experienced with them as well. So understand that you can be a standout even without having a full background in a new field. In case you haven't seen me before, John Krantz, author, career coach, and speaker. Resume and LinkedIn guru as well. So if you're a uh, career story is suffering from a poor telling. And really most clients that I work with, they have stunning backgrounds, but their storytelling capability in their career is, is really minimal. It's not there, probably because they're off doing amazing work for their employers. Then when it comes time to either look for the new job or in this case, make a change to a new industry, their story is hollow, empty, because they spent time living it and they didn't actually tell it in the most advantageous way possible. If you're suffering that way, if you would like to transition into a difficult area and need help, don't hesitate to reach out. All my services are over on my self recruiter uh, page, just under the services tab. And if you need to talk before you know which package is really right for you, send me a quick email, we'll set up a time to talk. A couple of the resources that will help you certainly my book is a great resource, it gives you the whole roadmap for job search, it's available on my self recruiter website, actually over on amazon.com as well. And really, whether it's the uh, story across resume, LinkedIn, your outreach messaging, uh, even even getting the wrong offer and having to renegotiate, all the secrets are in there. It'll help you a lot. A couple of the resources on LinkedIn, go over and click on my articles and you'll see a number of articles that will help you in whatever challenge that you're facing. So check those out. Please do like, comment, share, message, everything else. And by the way, wherever you're joining me today, whether that's my uh, Facebook page, whether it's my LinkedIn uh, live session, or even over on my YouTube channel, it's live streaming in all three directions. I hope you like, comment, share, message, all that kind of fun stuff. So let's get down to it. What do you do better or what would you like to do better than somebody else? This is about understanding why you either are or will be a standout in this new field. Um, <clears throat> everybody has a first day, so you got to put that fear aside. It's like, going to a new school. It's like, oh, it's a new school. Nobody likes that. But you know what? It's a school. We understand it. We more or less know what will be there. There will be new challenges, just like in going to a new job. We're going to have to go through some sort of a transformation. Now, here, the transformation, what we're really talking about is a transformation in how you've told the story of contribution in the past. If, if you did job A for quite some time, but now you'd really like to move over to job B, very, very different, you're probably going to go have to go back to the storytelling method for how you took credit for what you, what were you involved in? What were the projects? What did you deliver? Why, how did you help this company? All those things are important, but you're very likely going to have to go back and retell it through a slightly different lens, thinking about what would be advantageous to job B, what things did I touch that are transferable? And it's really learning how to morph your story still absolutely a letter true to a new direction that inspires people to go, I could see you doing this. Imagine your career were a lucid dream for a moment. Now, if you're unfamiliar with a lucid dream, that's a dream where the dreamer is somehow aware that they're dreaming and they believe that somehow they can influence where the dream goes. Uh, fun if you can do it. I don't know if you've done it uh, in your dreams in the past, but on occasion, certainly. And, and so, this idea of gaining some amount of control, that's about what the job seeker has, some amount of control if we exert all this control. So I want you to think about things being possible, uh, but we're going to have to think clearly and we're going to have to realign some of the story mechanisms that will open up pathways for us. So these target companies you'd like to switch to, uh, who are these target companies? Uh, what are these dream jobs of yours that you're thinking about in the new sector? Um, look at the very best people doing that job. Oh, I know that's scary for you because you don't necessarily have background in that job. And now you want me to look at the best of the best. I do. You can learn a lot from the best of the best. Sometimes it's as simple as how they talk about their skill set 
or how they talk about their engagement with a client or customer or whatever it might be. Sorry, will I grab a little bit of a tissue here? Um, so I want us to think about all of these things because we can learn from these people and it may affect how you go back and retell your story. In looking at these people and look at the companies and looking at uh, the dream jobs, what's missing from you? Is there something missing other than not really having done that particular job before? Um, if you've done all of the elements that are transferable, it gets a lot easier. Simply let's go back and retell that story in a different way. We're this product. It's our job to inspire them. They're, what it's not, it's not our job to get them to roll the dice on us. Yes, we'd like them to roll the dice on us, but, but that's a gamble. We want them to be confident in rolling the dice on us so they go, I'm not even sure what I'm going to get from John, but I know it's going to be very different than what I'm just going to get from one of those competitors. So we want to think about us, ourselves as a product in this new field. How should we look? How should we talk about ourselves? How should we present ourselves? Because small changes change absolutely everything. That's part of how you take control of the discussion. And you very slowly, after you rebuild your story on your LinkedIn profile, you very slowly, all your shares, all your conversation shifts from what you had been working on and focused on to suddenly the new thing you're excited by and would like to be working on. That's how you begin to morph that discussion and impression about you. But you're going to have to come up with some sort of idea for yourself in the first place. This is a product uh, demonstration, essentially. You're putting yourself out there for the world. So mistake that people will make is they may look at the field they'd like to go in and try to be cookie cutter perfect, thinking about who's the competitor. Oh, I have to be just like the competitor. Well, if you're just like the competitor, you realize I could take number three. Number three, I'm going to pay you less. Oh, you don't want less? I'll take number two. I'll take number five. None of that matters because you're all cookie cutter perfect, interchangeable. But we have to somehow accomplish that for a job we've never held before necessarily. But also, we can't just be that. We also have to be this person that somehow steps out of line. In addition to that is different, exceptional, special. That's how you get a better offer. That's how you get them to restructure the role so that maybe you get the responsibility level you're looking for. Inspiration is the mother of invention. So let's really discover your inspiration. We're going to play a little piece here. I'm going to bring it center stage. And then I'll be back in about two minutes. What makes you itch? What sort of a situation would you like? Let's suppose I do this often in vocational guidance of students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we have the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? What, how would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, We'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that and uh, forget the money. Uh, because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you could eventually become a master of it. The only way to become a master of something is to be really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much. Uh, that's uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. Anything you can be interested in, you'll find others in. But it's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like and doing things you don't like and to teach your children to 
following the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children and educating them to live the same sort of lives we're living in order that they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children, to bring up their children to do the same thing. So it's all wretched no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question. What do I desire? By the way, that's a piece uh, off of Facebook from Alan Watson narrating. Nice piece there. Really, it's down to the point of what do I desire? You know, life is a banquet from one of my favorite movies, and most poor suckers are starving to death. We get so entrenched in doing it one way, we don't think about the fact that we can reinvent in many ways. The reason I brought this movie up as well, in case you haven't connected all the dots, it's anti mame now, there are several anti mames out there, but there's really only one that's the 1958 Rosalind Russell anti mame. If you watch that movie, there's a terrific scope of reinvention across the entire movie, having to reinvent over and over and over. So, really, there are so many life lessons that are there, and also really job search lessons that are there. Um, it'll teach you to think out of the box in very, very different ways. A couple of visuals. <laughs> Auntie Mame has to reinvent herself in many, many ways, including right down to being a switchboard operator at Macy's. So I want you to think about if anything can be possible. Maybe what we have to do is sit down and take a deep inventory. Maybe we put our ego aside and we begin to write down everything we've ever done. Maybe you've been a shoplifting monitor or a stock person or a cashier or, or a retail manager or, or a shoe salesman. Maybe you've been a a chef or a restaurateur, maybe that's part of your background, or, or a business owner. Every single piece you've touched at some point in your life, write down, or a student, or maybe a retail manager, maybe a di digital service bureau tech, maybe a computer services manager, maybe you've been that in your past. All things are resellable. Maybe you've been a general manager in retail at some point. Maybe you've been a recruiter and headhunter, or a recruiting trainer, or, or <laughs> trading program manager, or maybe a VP over a hundred office company, maybe a founder of two companies. I think you already understand by now that every single thing on this list is part of my background. So when I said you can reinvent yourself many different ways, you certainly, certainly can, but we have to get out of our own way to ultimately get to maybe what is the thing that we should be doing, or maybe the thing that becomes what we are today. So you wouldn't normally look at this background and imagine who I am today, but you have that same level of opportunity to be able to pick and choose and put things in there that create the future that you want. Everything in there, by the way, has to be absolutely letter true, but you can leave out any part that you'd like. There's no sin of omission, just sin of commission. Make sure every single thing is letter true. <clears throat> it's our job really to teach them how to select us I talked a lot about this during my interview uh, intervention lecture. So with this same concept, as we're going to a new industry, a new field, new role, whatever it might be, it's your job to teach them how to select you. And that starts with what you do on the resume and how you put the story together, how you expand that story over on the LinkedIn side. So be sure to watch my resume renovation lecture and my LinkedIn lecture so you understand how those two marketing vehicles work for you then it's as simple as understanding your vocal presentation has to change as well because you have to accomplish a lot you have to position yourself as almost interchangeable probably for a field or job you haven't done before but also somehow still different exceptional this is the closed for inventory piece the deep dive into ourselves so you know, when I do this with clients and, and as I help clients reinvent, we do the same thing. We'll sit down, we'll do a deep dive interview that goes under everything. We're like under the rock, under the bed, in the closet. We're looking for every piece of story that somehow got missed or dismissed or let slip away so long ago. Uh, because you can't consider how to recast the story until you recapture all of the story that you, you've lost. Now, of course, we're trying to present ourselves as capable or qualified at the minimum that's not the real reason I'm going to hire you. Yes, we need to attain that in our presentation, but I wouldn't consider hiring anybody I didn't feel capable or qualified. So that's not the deciding piece. 
what it comes down to in almost every case is number one is chemistry above all other things. And number two is confidence in you above all other things in chemistry. And that's before the credentialing, the background, the who'd you work for, what was the actual work product and all of that, which really brings us down to what you see here. Why are you interesting or how are you interesting? And, and what is it that makes you tick? What drives you? Now, those two things could have something to do with your professional life, could have nothing to do with your professional life, but it's all part of your story and you're going to have to integrate it. Great example might be, oh, I think it was probably about four Octobers ago now, I was just putting the finishing touches on a brand new resume, brand new LinkedIn profile for a client. And suddenly she goes, oh, I'm, I'm about to be a four-time marathon runner next week. I'm like, well, what? You're about to be a four-time marathon runner? This is the first time John is hearing about it? That doesn't have anything to do with my job. It doesn't. <laughs> you seem like you're getting a little mature to me. Now, what does a four-time marathon runner communicate? Drive, ambition, uh, strong on goals, unstoppable, probably very good on my healthcare costs. Believe me, as a recruiter, I've heard them talk about it all behind the scenes. So let's not make, let's not forget to tell parts of the story that are interesting or about what makes you tick. Now, when I do this with clients, we come up with about eight or nine pages of notes from all that I hear, in addition to all the background material, old resumes and everything else, all bios and articles that may be out there about you. Who knows what you might have? The rest of all of the things across those nine pages, you have to figure out, well, what's valuable, what's not. So thinking about the new direction, new field and what's missing from looking at superstars, you need to go back and think about your own background and figure out which items rise to the level of helping them believe, helping them know that it's going to be the best business decision they make today if they choose to hire you. That's a big game changer if you can get to this level. So this is about chameleoning your way ever so slowly into a new career, into a new job. This may happen for you in one jump. It may take two jumps. It just depends on how big of a, a change you'd like to make. So we're going to have to know ourselves better than anybody else and really why we're more valuable than the next five or six people that want that job. So I want you to think in terms of things like these. The closer you get to a center point that includes these, the better you'll be. So what do you love to do? And, and I hope you do it well. <laughs> Is it something that you can get paid to do? Because if someone's not going to pay you to do it, that's a hobby and it's not going to come to a career fruition the same way that you'd like it to. Is it close to your passion or is there a way to bring your passion into the focus? What skills do you have to add to that? What else can you do? And really, what are you afraid of can even open some doors? All of this is meant to be a brainstorming exercise. So you begin to think about not what you say you might like, but really explore what you really might like. And does it really align with what you want? Let's take that. What am I afraid of? You know, I think back quite a number of years um, when I was in college and, and suddenly for what I wanted to do uh, on the list is I had to take a prerequisite of a speech class. Got to take a speech class. Got to have that before you take these next classes. I'm like, OK, well, sign up for the speech class. And, and um, I talk a lot about in these lectures, I'm actually shy and introverted no matter what you see here. And this is still what I do. And I found a way to do it, which means you can, too. And yet at that point, I'm like terrified. I'm like, oh, speech class, I have to take a speech class. But I can follow a recipe. I can learn and be taught and repeat. You know, I didn't, I had a great time in school. And so even though it was very stressful to me, I'm, I'm like, the professor taught us a recipe to put on a good talk. And all I did was assemble the talk, following the recipe and all the accoutrement and, and, and window dressing and all that kind of stuff that makes the talk interesting. And almost the whole time I am like gripped to the podium, as you've probably seen many speakers. Now I step to the side. I'm free of the podium <laughs> almost all the time uh, in, in, in person. But in this case, I'm like gripping the, 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 the thing mostly so I could control shaking. I'm like, I don't want to put my hand up and have people see me shaking. So I'm like, I'm going to grip, grip, grip. And uh, occasionally I had to make a gesture because that was on the recipe and over to here and engage someone, step away from the podium for a second and then rush right back and grab it. So I quit shaking. I get to the end of the light. I get to the end of my talk, which wasn't really very long. Maybe it was 10 minutes or 15 minutes, something like that. And I go to the back 
of the classroom about wanting to vomit <laughs> at this point. And, you know, some of the other students were like, oh my God, oh my God, you were so good. You were so good. I'm like, are you sick? <laughs> I just gave that and I know how bad that was. But compared to what they were seeing, even following the basic recipe was much more impressive even without the developed skill yet. So I was certainly afraid of being in front of that audience. I could think of nothing more revolting <laughs> than being a public speaker, having to speak in front of audiences and engage people. And yet that's what I needed to do. That's my spot. That's my sweet spot of where I love to be. And yet I didn't realize it. Now this you've probably seen many times. This is something I grabbed right off Facebook uh, quite a while ago. It's that magical intersection of all those things that were in the list, something we love to do and something the world needs, something that we do well, and, and we have to be able to get paid for it. And if we're not careful, as you see the little small verbiage at the bottom, if we're not careful, it can become a volunteer or vocation, which doesn't really pay us or, or deliver the career we want. So you have to find this magical spot of bliss that will help you a lot in reinventing. Plus to those ideas about yourself, because you're, you're defining a product, which is you, you have to think about well, which employers in my new direction would benefit most by the things I've touched in the past, the skills I bring to the table, because those employers will connect the dots much faster. And our job here is to shorten this transition. Add to that how you're interesting, what makes you tick, what drives you, and suddenly you can be chameleoning all over the place in all directions. One thing I've never allowed myself to do or, or be is be limited by a ridiculous eight and a half by 11 sheet of job description. <laughs> to me, that is a starter idea for this job that you just hired me for. You hired me for my brain. That's why you hired me. That's a starter list of ideas. I never let myself be limited by that paper. And, you know, that led to one point in my career, I was being promoted every four to five months. And while that was very welcome on the financial end, I'm like, oh, just in time because there's more bills due and New York City is very expensive. Uh, but, at the, but at the same time, there's this fear of, am I fooling someone? Am I fooling someone? My, my chest is hurting, you know, pounding. I'm like, and they keep putting more on John's plate. I wasn't fooling anybody. They were so excited by what I would do with what was already on my plate and take another one and take another one. Like, let's promote them up and see what happens. Chameleon your way right up the ladder. All of this restructuring of the story about you, this transformation that we're going to go through, that is resetting of your trajectory, your story. That's, that's your self recruiter in you taking control. That's one great recruiter. That's you. That's now going to essentially coach yourself into this transition or if you need help you know where to get a good coach over at self recruiter so think about the fact that you're going to heavily use linkedin in a very different way so be sure to watch my linkedin lecture to understand how to reach out to these companies behind the firewall of the company all of that's in the linkedin lecture uh, without going to hr and be sure to watch the uh, interview, I'm sorry, the interview intervention lecture so you know how to present yourself, but the resume renovation lecture so you know what to do on the resume in converting this whole story. Keep one eye on the toughest competitor imaginable. That's those scary people in the new field always have to have those. And we have to construct our personal branding. So we have to take this entire new story of you and take it across the resume. Make sure it's in the cover letter, connect the dots, for whatever you cannot accomplish on the resume LinkedIn to transition, connect the rest of the dots in the cover letter, make your case. That's what it's about. Business card, LinkedIn profile, signature block, all of those things can help move things over. In terms of resume, check out resume renovation. You have to change your resume to a resume that works in the modern world. In the modern world, no one will read. It is very frustrating. Now, Oftentimes I'm speaking at the New York Public Library and I have to say no one will read and I wait to get struck by lightning. And unfortunately or fortunately, <laughs> it never happens. But that's the world we live in. You know, we could send someone uh, a quick email that's like two sentences long. The answer they're looking for is right in the middle and they ask us again for it because they couldn't read the two sentences. So your resume has to convert over to something that is visually imprintable that I can see it, absorb it, see it, absorb it. Small changes 
change perspective. If they have to read your story, intellectualize it, conclude and, and come back to you, well, that's, that's not going to work very, very well. Then you take the same kind of structure over LinkedIn, maybe whatever you refine down to that single sheet of, of resume, maybe that becomes the structural backbone, the framework that comes to LinkedIn. But now you have to expand it into this three-dimensional sales brochure that, that helps fill in the detail. Check out my LinkedIn lecture. By the way, there's a very special version of my LinkedIn lecture right on my Self Recruiter homepage. It's all free. You can see me large, see the slides large, and you can really use it as a start and stop tutorial while you build out a better profile, unless you need someone to do it for you and then check out my services under the services tab. Your signature block can go a long way to also change minds about who you are and how they think of you. Most people don't use a signature block, which is, is something that's really missed, but I want you to think about the fact that your signature block should at least have a, a few basics on it of who you are, how you think of yourself, employed or unemployed, doesn't matter, how you think of yourself as a product, your contact information, so it's really easy. What, I have to put my email in my email? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. For you, I'll go up and I'll toggle, I'll copy. Okay. For you, yes. It's attention to detail because it's a demonstration of how you work. And of course, attach your sales brochure, which in my view is your LinkedIn profile, motivating them to take a look, connect with me on LinkedIn at, oh, click. And then suddenly on, they're on your sales brochure. Now here's my ridiculously long email signature. <laughs> First time I wrote this, rough Catholic, you know, all about guilt. I'm like, what would my mother think? I'm like, wow, looks like you made it, John. I'm like, it's very hard emotionally to use this type of stuff because it feels oh, immodest and, and lack of humility. You know, modesty and humility are great traits for all parts of our life but not job search and not career. Both of these spots, it works directly against us. So just like I've had to do, you're going to have to give yourself permission to use what you've earned, what you own, because it's real. Then we're going to use digital tools, essentially, to help us create the rest of the transformation. Now, primarily, we're going to talk about LinkedIn for that, but I'm a big, big believer that if you'd like to be employed, you also need to be on Twitter almost lose my lunch every time on that one. But it, it's not the 158 tweets over the weekend type thing. It's simply that maybe you don't even go to Twitter, but you open a Twitter, you connect it to your LinkedIn profile, and then every single thing that affects perception that you share out on LinkedIn, all about your new field, I hope, and, and new job and the challenges of that job and the things you could bring to that job, transformative. I let that flow out to LinkedIn and with a single toggle, even on the free version of LinkedIn, I can seamlessly let that go out to Twitter, really doubling my rate of advertising because sharing is advertising. Think about that for a moment. Now, why am I such a big uh, believer in Twitter? Because I can go to Twitter. You give me any, any, any field, any position, any level, doesn't matter. Give me a few minutes to think about it. And I can come up with four, five, or six words to go search on Twitter. Not to find someone capable. <laughs> it's like cat hair in your mouth. <laughs> dime a dozen, dime a dozen. Just the exceptional, the best of the best, exceptional people I'm looking for. Four, five, six words. Find them right on Twitter. I know. You think it's not possible. All you have to do is allow yourself to think like Sherlock Holmes, a little bit of detective working backward, aligning that sun, the moon, the stars. Well, if they were the best of the best. I bet you there's people listening today in your field where you think, oh, I'm the best of the best in my field. Okay. If you are the best in the best in your field, you've shared a best practices technical white paper, which you can simply Google best practices technical white paper. Come right up, explain the whole thing to you. By the way, you do not have to write that. I mean, you can if you want to, but there's no need to it. Um, someone already wrote many papers <laughs> on the best way to do your job best practices for your job. You just go find any one of those, good, bad, or ugly, doesn't even matter either. And then you share it with your opinion. What a great take on best practices for exactly what I'd like to do with a link. Not sure I agree with best practices for what I'd like to do because we're transitioning with a link. <laughs> Couldn't disagree more with best practices for what I'd like to do with a link. Now, obviously, it's not going to say for what I'd like to do, but it illustrates Whatever I'm talking about is going to be about that new direction. 
suddenly you realize the influence that this has, the power that this has. We need, we need to think about what we're going to use. Now, you, you saw Facebook, you saw Instagram. Facebook, I don't recommend for most folks in job search. Maybe I have two, three, four percent of my clients that might use Facebook for career. But that requires an incredible high degree of self-editing at all times because that becomes your public career persona if you're using it that way on Facebook. And you can't do any of the fun stuff. You can't get involved in small talk, that kind of thing. It, it has to stay really as focused as your LinkedIn, even though it's maybe less corporate looking. Instagram, I mean, if you're, if you're in creative, I don't know how you're not using Instagram as part of your entire presentation package. I use my Instagram really to showcase uh, the non-professional life for John, because even hiring someone to help you lift your career brand, to reinvent your resume or, or reinvent your LinkedIn profile or coach you through your challenges, um, they still want to know besides, of course, for being professionally right for that, what makes you tick? Why are you interesting? So on my Instagram, you see me hiking up the Hudson Valley or climbing Half Dome out in Yosemite when it's not on fire <laughs> and, and those kinds of things, really taking on challenge. Now, here's my LinkedIn. Uh, I Public speaker, I have a lot of connections, almost 12,000 connections, three levels out. That's a pool of 21 million plus people. So when I share something, it could land on any of those desktops that the algorithm that determines our destiny decides is appropriate. So you start talking on your profile all about the new direction that you'd like. You start to join all the right groups for the new direction that you'd like. You start to share all the right content that talks about the new direction that you'd like. The algorithm connects all those dots very easily, suddenly starts to put your content in front of the right audiences that would like to hire a person like you. We then just have to think of the whole thing as a chessboard and do a little bit of strategic sharing. This is part of how we brand our career. Now, I'm going to showcase here both LinkedIn, and you see how this profile on LinkedIn is set up. You're about to see Twitter in a moment, and, and you see Twitter's profile. Well, I use the same profile picture, but the banner's different, and yet they work together. It's a nice synergy. And then all of my shares, I let seamlessly flow across both platforms. Yes, I'm in most of mine because I'm a public speaker. I don't really expect you to be in most of yours. Maybe on occasion, like I'm at a conference and I took a selfie. Yeah, that kind of thing. But most of yours, I expect to be articles, books, events, things going on for the new direction that you'd like, because you have to start living and breathing that new direction, even if you're still working in this old direction. And suddenly all that content quickly shapes perception of who you are, why you're interesting, why they should maybe hire you. And as you begin to go after these new jobs and they come back to your LinkedIn profile, they suddenly see this list of shares and they go, oh, John is really interested in our new field. And you've effectively chameleoned your way, branded your career toward the new direction, even while still doing the old direction. So you want to think clearly, why am I using each one of these platforms? We can probably successfully manage two or three, maybe even four platforms. Beyond that, it's, it's not so easy to do it. But each platform, why am I using this platform? What are your goals for that platform? Are your target markets using that platform? I sure hope so. All this is about nuance in communications and really using our soft skills to really, you know, work for us. Part two here, after reinventing your resume, reinventing your LinkedIn profile, make sure to watch those two videos. Then we create a social media share plan for the new direction. This is that shares that you just saw coming across screen, except you're going to focus it on your new job, new industry, new players. And it's a mix of going after 25 to 30 items, articles, books, and events. For articles, I simply go to, to Google, click the news tab, put in the new field, the new industry, the new players in the field. And suddenly what you'll get are all these articles written all over the country about your new direction. Now I can post any one of those articles with a few words of my commentary, good, bad, or ugly, with a link. <clears throat> That begins to showcase me focused on the new direction. Do the same thing with books. I go to Barnes and Noble. I go to Amazon, whatever you'd like. Pull the right books for your new field. I begin to read those, of course, and share them with a few pearls of wisdom. Don't write very much because no one wants to read. Events, same thing. You know, every event that exists in the next 90 days already has a website. So 
I could be talking about those events now, even if I couldn't go to it. Maybe you might say to me, well, the best of the best would, would go to this conference in Vegas in, in September. I can't afford it and I can't take time off. But that conference in Vegas in September has a website right now. I could post about that right now. So excited for the such and such conference in Vegas in September with a link and the title to the conference. I am so excited. I didn't say I was going. I can't go because I, well, I have to work in this other field I don't like. <laughs> Two weeks before, I could pick out a nice speaker, someone that's really showcases and would be nice to be attached to me. It's like, oh, John listens to this person. And, and I could say, oh, can't wait to hear such and such speak at the such and such conference in Vegas in September. And I can't wait to hear them speak because I won't be there. <laughs> letter true, letter true. Um, even the day of the event. Almost every one of these events has an online session. I pick out an online session. I grab one of these. It does not really matter who makes it. I put the online session on my laptop. I shoot a little bit sideways, take a picture, post it. So interesting listening to such and such at the conference in Vegas that I'm not at. <laughs> I leave the, that I'm not at part out. You can get connected to all the right conferences, even if you're still working in your old job. If you have something really special, of course, you can place it on an editorial calendar so you don't forget to post it on a certain day. Most of it is creating this list, then waking up in the morning and going, oh, I have to do two total minutes of sharing in the day, which can be four, five, six shares. I simply go copy, paste, share. Boom. 15 seconds, right? Maybe it's a second cup of coffee. Well, I've already had my second cup of coffee, so I'm onto water. Uh, and I go copy, paste, share. Maybe it's time for lunch. Copy, paste, share mid-afternoon coffee hound, or copy, paste, share. End of the day, copy, paste, share again. That is two total minutes out of the entire day. And I have a proper social media campaign. I do it like breathing. If I've created the list of 25 to 30 items, then I wake up the next day and I just start wherever I stop. I keep going down, keep going down, keep going down. When I get to the bottom of the list, I go right back to the top and it goes around and around like a wheel for six to eight weeks. 25 to 30 items, no one statistically can see a repeat. And no one can even see a repeat looking at your profile because they'd have to dig really too far backward. That's a basic social media share plan. If you'd like a deeper telling of that, check out my career evolution lecture. It's 90 full minutes or in this online version, probably 60 minutes in person it's 90. Uh, all about that. So I want you to think about what it really is. Now, if we're going to be effective, also means we have to think like a storyteller. We're going to have to uh, tell that story in the advantageous way. Our job is to set the stage, set the lighting, and really draw them in in a way that showcases our assets. That's what it's about. Yep, our tone is going to be uh, like we're talking to a dear old friend, and we're going to allow ourselves to have very rose-colored glasses so that everything is really wonderful and all the problems in life disappear. Ideally, we'd like to put them in our shoes looking out of our eyes. That's the way to be most persuasive. So all of these things are figurative little nudges, the way you are going to create engagement, although it's a whole lot closer to that style engagement, really getting them to fall in love with your skill set for their team, simply through a little bit of a share strategy, using your network, using Twitter, and pushing message over and over and over. Now, here's a few shares to uh, give you a little bit of inspiration here. Uh, top left here, this was the first year I was, maybe I can make these a little bit larger. See them here? Oh, there we go. Uh, top left here, this was the first year I was up uh, on stage with Reverend Jesse Jackson, Rainbow Push Wall Street Project. Yep, did it four or five years, uh, pinching myself, going, oh my gosh, how did these things happen to me? I'm glad my picture there is quite small because if, you, if it were any larger, you would really see the stress level on my face. Not so much from the event, but that was the same week that my father was passing away in hospice at 91 years old. And not the ideal week, having to fly down to Florida to see my dad on the weekends, flying back for this event. And, and my dad was a Catholic deacon, so he was very excited going, oh, my gosh, how do these things happen for you? It's so interesting. And uh, and so that's a day I had about two and a half hours of sleep and I have a lot of stress because of what my father was going through. And yet opportunity is knocking. You have to go when the opportunity is there. Same thing, top right. Uh, got a radio show host calling me to ask me if I'm going to the, the Google keynote uh, during social media week. I'm like, absolutely. When is it? When is it? Oh, Friday, eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, fantastic. And so I showed up Friday, eight o'clock in the morning and the radio show host did not. <laughs> Again, another day of about two and a half hours sleep. 
And I was listening to the keynote. I was not giving the keynote. And uh, the person suddenly said, you know, the real world is insufficient. And it was like the Liberty Bell going off in my head. That's exactly what I've been trying to say for a very long time. It's not okay just to be great at whatever it is you do. You have to manage the perception of that or you get left behind. A couple of the other shares, uh, not very uplifting, but exactly right for what I do. There's a few more things to look at. Uh, up at w WHCR, Voice of Harlem Radio, and, and been up there a few times. It's always fun. It's two hours of drive time. And it means I have to get up. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning. It means I have to get up at 3.30 3 in, the, in the morning to I have to eat, everything else, get myself to, to the studio, slide into the chair, put the, the headphones on right at 6 a.m., and the host really prepares nothing. It's 100% off the cuff. And I, of course, I'm really great in that format and have a lot of fun. Uh, up on the top right, here I am uh, really up volunteering. I am up in Albany talking to the lawmakers, really looking for library funding. Now, to be super clear, John does not get library funding. That is volunteer work. But I'm up there really getting funding for the library and telling them how important that is as a safety net. Got featured in AM New York. That's always fun. Uh, many other places as well. Broke the uh, regularly scheduled uh, attendance uh, record for the library for anything that was scheduled. So I'm very competitive. I like that. Uh, some more articles on the right. Another highlight from AM New York. Then, then suddenly I get this call that I'm in Essence Magazine. I'm like, am I getting punked here? Well, I should go look. Now, First off, it was it was hard to find magazine stores because they'd already started to close all of those, even though they used to be all over town. And then Barack was on the cover. It made it even harder to find. But then suddenly there's my book right on the reading list. Well, you see that shorter gal there? She's the one that got me there. I'm suddenly outside the New York Public Library and she goes, oh, I'm because I'm, I'm answering questions. And she's, she goes, oh, I'm blogging about my job search for Essence Magazine. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you should have a copy of my book. I trust it would make it somewhere and it made it right onto the list, even though she was in the picture talking to another career coach. Don't look there. <laughs> All of this is endless self-promotion, which we may find distasteful, but it's what's required in the modern world. We're going to have to drink a little bit of that Kool-Aid as necessary to understand it's our job to promote. Here's a few more things. Did, did a Morgan Stanley event and posted that. I'm at Grace Institute and posted that doing my online boot camp. I know my father would love that pose. I saw him in that pose so many times as a Catholic deacon. Uh, up, at, up at WHCR Voice of Harlem Radio. My, I didn't make it into the shop, but my coffee and my book did. Small changes change perception. How are you going to change the perception of you from what you used to do to being the committed, passionate, energetic person that is really dying to take on this new direction? We're going to have to be persuasive. We're going to have to get ourselves ready and be confident. I know you can do it. Now, if you need help, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. It's very difficult for most people to reinvent their own career brand because we're so emotionally close to that story. It's very difficult to see it in a still truthful but very different way. If you need help, check out my self-recruiter website under the services tab. All my packages are there. And a lot of great videos and everything else. I hope you share these with as many people as you can. We have a, a really interesting one tomorrow at three o'clock, and that is marketing yourself to the decision maker. It's really how you step out of the job search line, get directly to the decision maker and really land that job. Thursday, that's at three o'clock tomorrow. Thursday at one o'clock is my ask self. I'm sorry, it's 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock Thursday is my ask self recruiter live Q&A. If you're not getting your job search questions answered, send them in. Send them in to ask at selfrecruiter.com. That's ask at selfrecruiter.com. All the best questions are always included. And we'll see you guys both tomorrow and on Thursday. Take care. Please do like, comment, share, all those kind of things. And we'll see you tomorrow.